163 to put in that podcast. You got Tone Sess, yep, Asia, yep. Asia, and me, your boy George D. All right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully, I caught the last pin tap in live. Um, that was a very interesting one. Did you watch the replay? Of course, I did. Okay. <laughs> there was, all right, I just want your opinion because you've been on the last. So, what are your opinions about the love topics? Um, types of love. Oh Stein, no, I Stern. thought it was so dope. I definitely You appreciate it. Okay. Oh yeah, I appreciated all that. Yeah, okay, I, I got a few. shout her out. Who was what's the girl's name? Who was on it? She held Karina. it down. Karina. Karina. Karina yes. Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah, she yeah, held it down. Definitely. Shout out she Jersey. She in Bergen County. Yes. <laughs> shout out. She said Brooklyn, I think, or what have you. Um sure. Instagram locked us out. Couldn't bring nobody else on the live, but you know, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we for got those, shout out Janae too. She yeah, Janae so wanted to bad. get in. Janae wanted to cop a hat too. So, you know, yep. shout out to her for supporting the podcast in both of those ways. Um, very good conversation. We're gonna keep this conversation going. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, definitely please subscribe right now. Um, go to our Instagram at Pintap underscore podcast, hit that link. You can subscribe to any podcasting platform. Or you can just go to our website, put in there podcast.com, watch all the videos and listen to all the audio there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today in studio. We've been waiting for this for a while. To be honest, we've been waiting for you for, for you and your kind to come in here. I know people are like you're kind. So I said that on purpose. His name is Chris Dawson. Yep. All right. All right. What's up? What's up? And oh no, it's no applause time. Huh? I mean, you said it with a question mark. I thought you had to correct you, but yeah, we can get up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in the studio we got Chris Austin. Yay! Sorry about that. I thought he was right, about right. to throw out an alias or something. All right, that's not his name. A K A C A. I know right, exactly. Okay. Nah. <laughs> um, you can find him online right on uh, Instagram right now at the Chris Austin. Um. Been looking forward to a comedian. Shout out Asia. You hey, know what I'm saying? You. you know, Asia's my girl, man. You know, hey, I'm glad uh, to be here. You know, definitely, you know, love what y'all doing. Love the vibe. It. Shout out to Asia. You ain't, ain't let you get your owl off. Yeah. Yeah, he was I, speaking, right? I speak. Yeah, she ain't got her <laughs> <laughs> We got Asia, Asia in the building. Ew. Wow. <laughs> We're going to make up for it. We missed it. We're going to come right back. Y'all right. just got to take that. Right. Um, But we got Chris Austin in the building. First and foremost, I'm happy to be you, for you to be here. We've tried a couple times to get comedians on the show. Um, we, we've we had only one particularly that was real when I was in L.A. that one time. But, you know, he was too busy looking at what was near the pool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, didn't, I, didn't have his, I didn't have his undivided attention. And plus, you're uh, so comfortable around us as the homie that he don't get into his comedian. No, he don't. He, he don't, don't. Yeah, he just try to come like, you know. Smooth, they don't really come into his funny bag. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but he's a fucking hilarious, super hilarious. Yeah. So, how did you get into comedy? Oh man, so started back in November of 2012. It was actually a bet. Um, I was actually in DC. Uh, we were at one little comedy show, and the comments were just trash. I'm not gonna lie to you. They were <laughs> trash. They were, they were kind of trash, and you could tell the crowd was like that. And I was like, man, I told my homeboy. Uh, he was. I said, man, I could do that. He's like, yeah. really. That's a bet. That's a bet. And I was like, okay, then. Go ahead. I go up there. I said, all right. I told the guy, I said, hey, man, you know, can I come up there? Like, do up there? He's like, why, you think you're funny? I said, kind of. And I was like, all right, I'll yeah. give you five minutes. I was like, no, just give me three minutes. I was like, I ain't trying to, like, <laughs> think I'm a world beater now. But I went up there, uh -huh. did my thing, you know, a few impersonations and all that stuff, and just caught fire after that. So, so what impersonation did you do? Now we got to put you on oh, the side. Man. <clears throat> so... Um, one of the impersonations I did was like, I told a joke about, this was probably around Obama and Romney, and Romney wanted to cut PBS. I said, like, you can't imagine how Elmo would be pissed off, you know what I'm saying? Oh, He's like, like motherfucker, <laughs> what the hell going on? Elmo <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't like none of that shit, you know? <laughs> Hold on, I just want to just say something else. <laughs> I mean, something else. I mean, but you know what, Elmo? If you, if you go down there a bit, it sounds like Bobby from Bobby's World. Oh, all types of oh wow. Yeah, you know, so I mean, you just, just kind of play with it. I mean, I, I grew up just doing a lot of impersonations and stuff. You yeah. Know? So, I mean, it was just something that was always kind of like in my, in my um, 
in, in, in my in my in my spirit to do it. Uh, and the funny thing is, my sister was actually the comedian in the family. Okay. So I wound up writing jokes for her. We would always clown. Like sometimes we would, we would prank call my grandma. Yeah. You know, we would like you know she's like stop calling my damn house. You know. Like yeah. That. So you know we would just be doing different personations <laughs> and stuff. So yeah. you just you know you just kind of have fun with it. You see stuff in church, you be clowning and stuff. You know, it just uh-huh. you know life is funny. You know, you just gotta make the most of it. You know. So I think it's just where. It just started in 2012, but it's been, I've been a lifelong comedian and fan of the game. And I just always trying to find different perspectives and stuff. Though. Did you have nerves? How how strong were the nerves? You know, it was, it, I, I was nervous as hell. So it, okay. mommy, I used to um, run track. And every time I, at the track, man, you got to. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Boy, you got to take shit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 hey, well, yeah, do that job. Yeah, you got to make sure you're all the way good. I'm good now. But, you know, I, 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 I always, like, um, had that nervousness, but it was always like an excitement with it. You like, okay, I don't care if I'm bombing. This is just gonna be the experience of it. You know what I'm saying? That is a good it, mentality. Yeah, to have. Just, you got you got to be that way. You got to put it out. They like put it in the air. Mm-hmm. Fact though. Hey, you know, you know, hey, I mean, it's just it's just kind of like how with comedy. I tell people it's like the best form of uh, public speaking because you have to engage people. You know, giving your personality, mm-hmm. read the room, yeah. and overall make them laugh. Yeah, you know you got to be funny because you can you could tell a speech whatever like that. Oh, that's a good speech, but people will judge you if you're funny. They'll let you know quick. And ain't, no, ain't no bullshit with that. So that's one thing I, I appreciate that rawness about it. Yeah. Wait, so I, you you said that you know you were success, successful your first time going on stage, right? Yeah. All right. So did you have like a little streak where you were bombing? Oh yeah. Before you got good. <laughs> yeah. Man, it was one time. Oh, what was it? Um. This is probably turned to like one of those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day kind of thing. So I got a fucked up haircut that day. I had got a fucked up haircut. My jeans was too tight. Everything was just off, you know. And I was at. Um, Why are you wearing tight jeans? Well, you know, skinny jeans back then, you know. I mean, you know. You don't have to subscribe. To you know, I, I thought. Well, I'm, I was. I was. A, I was. A, I was a slender dude. You know. You know. I was like, I, I can fit this, but man, them jeans was. In, I must have had them in the washer or something. Must have dried too tight. <laughs> She let them, you, you know. Got the bubble guts. She was up there like girls be feeling. Yeah, trying to tuck it in. Tuck it in. I was sitting there feeling like a little thing. I mean, I, I still had a six pack back then, but I felt a little bit come over, you know. <laughs> a little, 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 little spillage. Me, kind of hanged over a little bit, you know. <laughs> you know. So man, I remember we got got up there. I started trying to tell some jokes, man, and like you know, I was trying to incorporate different little things. And sometimes as comedians, you know, you go out there, you want to try a new jokes because it's like you always practicing. It's mm-hmm. never like. You have a joke down solid. Like mm-hmm. you can look at any comedian, like Kings of Comedy or Bernie Mac. You know he would tell his joke about you know the, the school bus. You know my sister King's over there. He might over here. Bernie, but, you know, my favorite. He, yeah, man. Whew. Love that man. Rest in peace. But you know it's just you all. You're always practicing your craft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still find ways to do a joke. You know, but sometimes junk don't work out. I remember one old lady was like, yeah, that ain't funny. I'm like, well, shit, you ain't pretty, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just, take, you just take an L because at the end of the day, it takes a lot to go in front of like a strangers and talk on the mic to make people laugh. Facts. You know, people would rather shoot people instead of going to public speak. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you just do it. Nobody ain't going to say shit like, hey, well, big props. I couldn't do that junk. You know, I mean, it's just a, it's humility, but you got to have that kind of tenacity to want it. So All right. I love it, man. So, some weeks back, mm-hmm. I went out to dinner, and one of the uh, the guy, one of the individuals at dinner was a comedian, and I've heard other comedians express, forget the background story. So, what happened is, I literally was like, we were talking, and then um, we were talking about the, the today, how you have so many individuals on Instagram, or using social media and just doing skits and things of that nature or whatever. And I didn't qualify them as a, being a comedian at the time, right? That was my thought process. I was thinking that for the person that actually gets up on stage, gets in front of people, works the material, like there has to be some differentiation between them and them, right? Mm-hmm. And it became this serious conversation. He was like, no, nah, they're comedians. And I was like, okay, whatever. But he took it personal. Like I was literally calling him, them like some derogatory term. Oh, yeah. So as a comedian, when you see, do you dif- differentiate the two, like between those that actually walk up and actually do stand up versus the individual that might just be on social media, just doing 
skits and things of that nature? See, that's a good question. Because, see, what you're coming from is more about the, the old school mentality. Like, okay. You talk to a lot of guys like D.L. Hughley's, Cat Williams. You know, Cat Williams like, you know, Tiffany Haddish, she is not funny. Tell me a good Tiffany Haddish joke. No, mm. you can't. I mean, mm-hmm. but that's how the way he is. He feels about way. But, you know, if you're making people laugh, for me, I, I respect it as a form of comedy. But when you're thinking about, like, stand-up comedian, now, if you say stand-up comedian... Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a different level. I mean, because okay. it's it that's the ones that you grow up with. You go you out there on the circuit. You're grinding hard, doing all type of shows. You know, just going through that grind. Mm-hmm. I think what makes it where you get some of that old school and new school kind of clashes because now you have a platform like Instagram. Mm-hmm. You know, all the different things, YouTube. You can put something out there, and you just send your couch. You be talking about some. You see, um, what's the guy name? Um, he just comment on videos and just kind of give his perspective, like, you know, man. Ryan. Yeah. Ryan Davis. Yeah, Ryan Davis. Yeah. I like so, Ryan Davis. Yeah, just commenting, you know, and and that can work for people, you mm-hmm. know. But then it's kind of like some people may not respect it because it's like you're you're pivoting off of something else. But you know, but old school stand-up comedians still take like issues they see and still talk about it, mm-hmm. you know, but they just give it a different perspective. I I think, you know, with comedy, like you could think about some of the, you know, greatest comedians in the world were probably just in movies doing sketches Mm -hmm. you know but some can transition some can't you know but um i think one of the one of the greatest comedians i i personally love of all time rest in peace is patrice (gasps) o'neill did you see the doc i haven't seen the doc okay (sighs) yeah that that dude was Was amazing wasn't true you know what i'm saying now if he wanted you talk about relationships and stuff man he was that guy he was the first Kevin Sanders. Yeah, he was the first Kevin <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you weren't going to say shit to him. He was like 6'5", like 300, something, 400 pounds. Mm-hmm. But man, he was just funny. But, you know, skit-wise, he probably wasn't that funny, but he was that dude. Like, yeah, he was that yeah. dude. And so I think you got to ex- respect it. I kind of, I kind of more partial towards the, the, the old school kind of stuff. But at okay. the same time, you, you kind of had a thing where it was like, like, like the Wayans, mm-hmm. they did stand up, but they also did sketches. You said some of your best sketches, sketches. all time in Living Color, you know. But mm-hmm. I respect all I respect all forms of it. All right, I think we all watched In Living Color. What's your favorite sketch on In Living Color? Mm. Man. Shit, Why so much you probably can't even uh-huh. can't even like, probably speak about that? it. Like what you thought was, funny. <laughs> it was so flagrant back then. Oh, man, you got Handyman. But you got um, homie the, the clown, clown. homie the homie yeah. the homie yeah. the homie yeah. the clown, abusing little kids. Yeah. Yes, you got the uh, the men on film. Men on film. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, like you came in like what, what, thought that was Fire funny. Marshall Fire Bill. Bill. Uh, Let me show you something. You know, like who was Tommy Davidson character? The the postal guy. Oh, um, God. dang, I don't remember that one. I remember um, Tommy Davidson had that one that karate guy. You know, huh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was yeah, just yeah. took me back. I remember when that Lemon Color series had dropped. Man, I went oh, and got man. everybody was trying to collect all the DVDs. Oh yeah, man, that was Blockbuster sure. days, baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, even before Blockbuster, you was watching somebody house. Yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. On TV. yeah. Facts. Shout, out, shout out to y'all new millennials. I don't know about Blockbuster, man. Man. Nah. Red boxes is as close as they color. got. All living color. Yeah. yeah late, y'all don't either. know about late fees. Like, you know. <laughs> 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 nah, that's what's up. <laughs> Being <Nah>. in debt. <laughs> <laughs> the blockbuster. <laughs> yeah. God, Credit dude. all jacked up because of, cre- uh, because of you Blockbuster. You can't get your first car. Oh, <laughs> 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 Yo, oh, that man. is hilarious. <laughs> um, but now nah, I want to do I do want to do this I do want to shout out all the comedians out there I think it's a underappreciated profession yeah it is or what have you why do you think it's underappreciated I think comics should be paid well much more than they I put it this way when you look at the comedy space like in terms of let's say Hollywood or whatever it's only like reserved for like a select few but there are so many that are super talented right. if they were given the platform like. One of the um, comics right now that I, I just can't stop watching this dude, Carlos Miller. Mm-hmm. This dude just has the knack. Like, he just, yeah. like, sometimes you can tell he's just walking on stage and he just getting his material as he's just looking at people. You know what I'm saying? He can do a whole five-minute set on one thing. Like, he just got the knack for it or whatever. But um, when I looked at his career, like, this dude's been grinding since, like, 2008. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Before that. Yeah, probably 2004, 2008, but I know you started really seeing them, seeing them in 2008 from Mississippi to Atlanta, then to Hollywood, and then the thing is just to see how it all comes together. And then when you run into other comics, right? 
So I shouted out one er, um, early um, rail battle. I went to go see one of his shows at what's that spot in Baltimore? Uh, oh, Mick, right. Mick something. Oh, wow. You know, it's kind of like in the county. Yeah, okay, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, it's some. I'm yeah, about that one. yeah, it's like McDougal's or Mick something. Yeah, yeah. But in any event, we I go there, and then after the show, I go backstage, and we're like chilling backstage, and then he's like, "Ah, let's go next door to the restaurant." So I go back to ne- next door to the restaurant, and then I'm there with like eight comics, <laughs> right? So like, it's nothing better to sit with eight comics and just kind of see them kind of just kind of just talk and work out jokes and be like, yo, that was funny. You should have, uh, and they're working with each other. And then I'm sitting there and I'm just asking questions like, yo, how long you been doing this? How long you been doing this? How long you been doing this? And you saying that some of them doing it for the pure love. Yeah. They want the bag, but they're not getting it yet. So I just shout them out because they actually helped me live life. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. without, la- without the laugh that I get, Trust me, I don't know Man. what life would be like out here. <laughs> all, all the trauma that we deal with, they make it digestible. Like, oh, hell yeah. yeah. Nothing nothing is hands off for, for a comedian. Sometimes you need that that perspective. Like, you know what? We can move past this now. All yeah. right. Yeah, I was exactly. able to get that laugh off. Now we can move past it. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll say one thing, too. Yeah. I mean, shout, shout out to uh, one comedian that helped me get into the He actually gave me the opportunity back in 2012 was Rob Gordon. Okay. Um, You know, he's a he's a... Great guy, you know, he's been doing stuff in Hollywood, just being in movies and different things. And so, yeah. you know, I respect that man's grind because nobody really knows, like, everybody kind of always, I mean, in life, everybody sees, like, the, the final result. Mm-hmm. But just to be appreciative of that process, you know, you got people been in there for 20 years. You yeah. Know? You wouldn't even know it. But it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of like when it's your time, your time. You, know, mm-hmm. you just do what you can, you know. But even what you were saying about, like, how comedy, you can kind of say what you want. You mm-hmm. know, but it's getting to like a lot of like the old school comics, you know, you got that cancel culture where now it's like you say some jokes, you don't know if that's going to come back on you. And you, people don't look at it as, uh, as, a, as objectively anymore. It's just more like, oh, he said this, he said that, but you're not getting the whole thing. I mean, even um, Dave Chappelle talks about it. I was it, just about to ask you, what you yeah. think about the Dave Chappelle's stance on it where he's just like, man, fuck it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're a reflection of yeah. society, so... Yeah. I mean, there's always some truth to comedy. You know, I mean, I think and you have to be... You have to be yourself. You can't go out there trying to fake it because it catches up to you. And so you're going to say what you're going to say. You're going... It's like... It's like being president. Some people are going to like you. Some people are not. You're just going to have to roll with it. Obviously, if enough, enough, enough people are laughing, then it's a good joke. And if it's a bad joke, you find a way to re- reinvent it, so... Facts. Yeah. So <clears throat> we might get a little serious, but hey, <laughs> we got Chris Austin here, so he'll lighten it up so you'll be able to digest it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the first one is this. Kevin Samuels has been, I mean, over the last couple months, Close. I mean, we've been hearing so much about him, uh, so many opposing, differing views, differing views about Kevin Samuels, his position on relationships, women, this uh title of high value men and so forth. And he recently sat down with Joe Budden and they had a good interview. They allowed him to speak. Granted, what's homeboy cool. on Joe Budden joint now? Who, who's, who's sitting across? Light skin dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, ish. I think that's Ish. You just kept interrupting him. He was like, man, I think I got two Kevin Samuels on the show today. Know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, Ish was passionate. Yeah. But nevertheless, Kev, Kevin Samuels, I was about to call him Kev like I know him. Yeah, that's shit. Your man. Yeah, that's your man. <laughs> like my man Kev, you know, he was... He did get an opportunity to kind of articulate his ideas, thoughts, feelings, and emotions about various topics. So we're just going to delve into it. No particular order. Um, what stood out from that interview for you guys? Anything? Asia. Everything. Uh, <laughs> so you already know I was ready and getting prepared for this. All right. And I think like most importantly, because he's now like his goal and priority is talking about women. So when we start to think about what he thinks about women and how does he think, you know, women, the I guess the 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 structure or the dynamic in which he thinks that, you know, women rate how he's rating women, I think that's mm-hmm. what I wanted to say, right? And um Basically, his premises on his arguments and how he's presenting himself and how he's definitely like building his audience and what he's talking about. And one key thing that I will say that I took away from it that I didn't have that perspective before in listening to him is that really he's talking about the attack on black men and black relationships. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that I could get behind because normally he's not palatable for me to listen to and just how he's, you know, 
sharing information and or choosing to judge black women. Like, I don't appreciate his tone. I don't appreciate, but it's provocative. I get it, right? I get that people watch it and it's his commentary is exciting. It's entertaining, right? And I think for, you know, sometimes people no longer want the lens to be on them. I think it's always about, you know, black men not making enough money because when we're talking about building a family or being high value, that's always what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. And then I also think that Kevin Samuel and listening to him, that he spent a lot of time building himself up. Because, you know, if you listen to the sound bites um, and some of the arguments that he was presenting, right, he talks about being young and not having any money and how the women have money and they have resources because she had food stamps and she was eating off food stamps while he's out here struggling, mm -hmm. you know, on oodles and noodles. I don't know what the women he married looked like, but obviously, you know, that didn't work out for him. The Twice, didn't he say he was married like twice? Yeah. I think he, he mentioned that. So that didn't work out with him. Um, I don't know if he has children, but I know that's something that he aspires to have because he talked about wanting to have a relationship and move forward. And so what I really wanted to take away from there is not any of the negative about Kevin Samuels, but when we talk about the attack on black men, you know, that's something I'm very passionate about and I can get behind because I have a son. So when I look at my son and thinking about, you know, him being high value and some of the obstacles that he will have to um, survive, you know, just to become a mature man who is able to provide for a woman, you know, um, I want to understand from the men that are in this room how you guys felt about it. Like, what was your takeaway from from some of the things that he shared and some of his struggles about being a black man, about being, you know, ready to be a husband. Right. Um, I think that was more profound for me. And, you know, then I understood why he chose to start the arguments the way that he does. Right. So he's not necessarily attacking women. He wants us to be more realistic and understand that black men have it very hard. So when you discredit a black man, based on this criteria and you here are no prize, right? He's like almost saying that we all have to come to the table differently if more black men and, and more black women are going to be married past a certain age. So mm. I won't say that I necessarily agree, but I definitely could appreciate his approach. Mm. Y'all want to go? Now go. <laughs> you got the table. All right. So for me, you know, I've, 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 I started following Kevin Samuels about maybe like a, maybe a few months ago. My home, homeboys hit me up about him. He's yeah. like, yo, man, who, look at this cat. And I was listening to him. And a lot of things he, he kind of came from, like, was, was for me, true. And listen, just being in the circles of men, you know, so kind of, you can kind of always pick up little things that men talk about. We try to Correct. explain it, but we don't always explain it the best way. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I know where he was coming from with a lot of things. Because the way that what I took from the interview and a lot of his other stuff is kind of like how where women kind of gauge, you know, who they want to be with. You know, it's very, it's very nuanced in the sense of like, got to have this, got to have that. I don't want that. I don't want that. He kind of talked about like, I don't want no scrub. Women tell you what they don't want, mm -hmm. you know, but then you find out like, I don't want this, uh-uh, girl, you know, but a lot of times they wind up getting the guy they, you know, you know, they intend to have, but some are very meticulous about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it just depends. But I think for me, it's like, I always looked at when women start telling you about what they want in the man. It, you remember that game back back in the day called MASH? Yeah. Remember MASH? Mm -mm. It was like mansion, apartment, shack, Oh, house. yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to you say, you, yeah. you know, okay, yeah. this is the job they're going to have. This is the salary. Yeah. You know, the car they're going to drive and those things. You had to do a little circle, change mm -hmm. the number you had to go through. And it's kind of like that. You know, and you you get at a young age where you do understand the economics behind things. And I think that's where, okay, you say, oh, I want a million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars. But then there's there's always a caveat with everything, you know, like with those type of guys. And so you're talking about upper echelon guys. And then one thing I liked about when his podcast that he said was like, let's say one of us got with Halle Berry, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. Most men be like, man, hey, that was a good, that was just a good time to get it. You know what I'm saying? We don't go mm -hmm. thinking like, I'm going to go see if I can hit her up again. You know, hey, mm -hmm. that was the moment. But woman got with like, you know, um, I know LeBron James got a wife, but somebody up like that, you know, like LeBron James type, they be like, oh, I didn't got a taste of this. I know what this lifestyle is like. I'm going to make sure I stay in there. Yeah. I ain't going back to Hamburger Helper no more. But mm -hmm. not to say that that's actually exactly bad, but then. What are you doing to put yourself in those type of positions? What kind of mentality are those women having? And I think the thing that gets lost a lot, what he's saying is like, women don't really know what men want. 
Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times men, we I don't... I disagree with that. No, and but, I wasn't going to go there so you went there. So okay, I was so waiting. Women, <laughs> I women really don't that. know what men want. Yes, I disagree And men, at the same time, are also afraid to say what their wants and needs are too. Mm-hmm. Because... I, I disagree with that. That's why. Okay. Yeah. That's why they're afraid. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not for that reason because I see a lot of men and they know exactly what they want, right? They know exactly what type of girl they decided to talk to. They know exactly what it takes to have that girl on their arm. And if you have defined that as money, high value men, then you know exactly what it's going to take for you to get what you want. You know that you might have a particular, you know, type. And so for you, you tend to probably want to talk to a girl that's in that type, yeah. right? Physically, so, maybe. Physically. physically yeah. So so then let's define that. Physically, and then we'll start there. Yeah. So I men mean, so that's where it all starts. It all starts physically. Every, everybody starts there. Yeah. So what's the difference between men and women if we're all starting from a physical place? Well, because he don't. She cares about what he does and what and maybe what he does and um, how much he earns. Where he just care about is this what I want to wake up to every okay, day? Okay, but yeah. I, I I also disagree with that to a degree because the package needs to be correct, right? What so in terms so of what? when you when you see a woman, right, and you know, and she's attractive, right? Are you thinking about that's my wife, or are you thinking about I want to have sex with her? At what point do you decide? Just she bad. That, Right. So it's all, it's just, it's just about her being attractive. Just about her being attractive. Just about, and that's, so it's the baseline for everyone. Now, a woman is understanding when they start out, when we're all young, everybody starts out at the same baseline. He's attractive. I'm attractive. Okay. We're attracted to each other. So can we start there? That's the basic premise. Mm -hmm. Hold on. We talking about, we talking about (laughs) adolescent love or we talking about adult love? Well, are we talking about adults or are we well, talking about adolescents? We're, well, we're going to do, we're going to say both because it, I mean, are you talking to women that you don't find it, are, that you're not are attracted to? Are women are talking to men that are not attracted to? Yes. Yeah. Women are talking to men that they are not attracted to. Women Oh, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. After they, they done crashed and burned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's oh, no. always it's after yeah, crash yeah, and burn. Yeah, yeah. But, but so, but, but I is. mean, men, men crash and burn too. Men yeah. talk to the, the the gorgeous girl, didn't I? I mean, I just put that in my story. Where where um what was it? What was the game? He was like, Y'all average guys out here, everybody wanna date an IG model, a girl who's getting how many thousands of likes, mm-hmm. and y'all really need to be talking to the girl with the blurry picture. Y'all pass fact? her over. Is that true? That's what he said. It's the flip side of what Ke- Kevin Samuel said. said. So, if you have a problem with so, Kevin, what Kevin so, says. So, so I'm not having a problem with what Kevin is saying. I'm having a problem with men agreeing with the fact that women have a preference and they're saying that men don't. If women choose to have a preference for a man who's more financially stable, the, what is the no, problem with that? What I believe Virtually, Kevin is saying is not that the, 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 a woman and a man do have a preference. They do. What he's saying, though, is that men are more realistic about their preferences, understanding that they have to level up in order to have that preference. Where women, the women he's speaking to, he's saying these women want or have a preference that is out of their league. They're not bad enough, accomplished enough, have the access enough, the network enough. That's why these women are getting surgery. That's why these women are And they still are not measuring up. The surgery only, it's like he's saying that. You have something that may get you into the room, but it's not enough it's not to keep the you in the room. It's not sealing the deal. I mean, yeah. He's talking about, what, what, what's, what's his thing? He says marriage. And and the, and the one thing that's a problem with our society, as, a, as before, is like everybody got options, but nobody's willing to make the choice. True. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we can all we, we can all say that. You know, yeah, I got this dude, I got this dude, but nobody's making the choice. Or I got this girl, I got this girl, but, but you ain't making the choice. I'm victim of that. Everybody's a victim of that. You know, to, uh, doing that. And I think it's where what happens is, is is where what he's saying in this sense of like, OK, if I'm a dude and I see these girls right here, I know what I got to do. I'm 5'11", man. I'm like, what, 180. I know if I want to get a certain type of woman that look like that on IG or something like that, I'm going to have to work out. I'm going to have to look like something that's going to stand mm-hmm. up. Most of them would be like, hell, I got to jump between my legs. I can get up. That is right. But see, and, and I, but that's, cause... but that's, but see, to some degree, I can't agree with that because I see the women that are on IG. I see the women that are going after these men, and these women are not fat and overweight and not all the time. No. You know, they're they're not undesirable women. So this is not a true <clears throat> fact for me, right? I think yeah. that the if he wants to talk about numbers and he wants to talk about averages, that's where I can agree with him. Yeah. So for the amount of women that exist that want that high value men. 
it, it is not that many of them that are within the category that they're, if you want to date a man in a million dollar category, that percentage is super low. It is. And then, and so now, yeah. so when he's talking about is versus, you know, women, because men aren't really, I don't want to say that they don't care, but it is not one of their primary factors in determining how we, whether we get together or not based on how much I make. Right. So he's saying that the law averages aren't there to exist for women to have to have. That's why women have unrealistic perspectives. That's, and that, and so that, that's what I agree with. Yeah, that, but I won't that say is. that women are any men are have any less preference about the type. Of no, woman I don't think not, I, I don't not, think it's, it's about that. that. I, I think it's where he's getting to the point. Like you got to look past the superficial stuff. Like, look at yourself. Like, what is about your personality? Because nobody talks about women's personalities about like, hey, sometimes you might be just being an asshole. Yeah. You know, yeah. sometimes the fact that you may not cook or clean up after yourself or do certain <laughs> shit like that. And you'd be like, God damn, you know? And as a man, you'd be like, I just need somebody to kind of hold it down this. And it's not like, and, and let's get this straight. Cause there's a lot, a lot of men who be at, I make this amount of money. She's making this amount of money, but then nobody's at home. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's doing that. You can have, you, you, you can say how you want this quote unquote power couple. Somebody's going to have to give something. Yeah. It's it's, yeah. it's just it's not realistic. All these like different little movies you see. So I like that perspective. I you, like that now. You know. If we start talking about power couples and and being a partnership and a team, what does it look like for um, the household to be maintained? That, I would like Kevin yeah. Samuel to talk about that. I don't. It, he may, but I, yeah. what I what I gleaned from that episode, one of the things that I got from it was he was saying that listen, women have. Books and books and books and movies and movies and movies and so forth and so forth. This always telling women, always saying what women want. Yep. But there's nothing really out there that says what men want. And he said, I'm not talking for all men. I'm talking about these specific men in this specific that fall into this specific category. This is what they want. And I think that part of the reason why people are beefing or going at them is because they don't want to be told you don't qualify particularly in terms of these types of men because well, this is how that's they hurtful, think. But his it's the truth, his though. his his dialogue about cooperation sounds a lot like control. I don't think so. Yes, I, it does. I, 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 and and let me just give you my point of view on why, and then you can share okay, yours. Okay. But his <laughs> See what I'm sounds like no, don't do that. He's here to shut. Like, no, oh, here we go. <laughs> no, because when he when he talks <laughs> about a woman <laughs> being able to be cooperative, right? Because that's what he said, right? He's like, women aren't cooperative, right? What is uh, cooperation really boils down to when a final when a decision has to be made in the household, he's saying that it should defer to the man. I'm saying it should defer to the person who knows best. You're not wrong. But here's the thing. In his house, as that high value man, he's saying that's how they operate. It's not about what But if he wants, He's not saying you're wrong. You, I, this you, is what I'm getting. How do you love somebody that you want to cooperate with you but you won't take their opinion? This is Georgia's thought direction. process on this whole yeah, thing, yeah. right? These individuals operate a particular way. I think there's maybe some narcissism there, but there yeah. definitely is a control factor. Yep. They yes. run everything that is in their environment, point blank, period. They may delegate, but for the most part, they run everything in their environment. But isn't I, he also single? He Yes. Right. But, but let's, but, 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 not, not putting him on trial, but, but I'm just saying, like, no, real quick, to, to, to the end, to, to, to end the point. So I think that he's saying that for this individual or for this individual that's fulfilling this role or playing this role in his life, this this is the way this operates in order for it to proceed. That's it. And if me, you can play that role and operate that, that way, from great. a girl who's not on your financial level, so, because any woman that is on your financial level, she's also had to make the decisions mm -hmm. and deal with the experience because he likes to quote how he's from corporate America. I'm from corporate America. So let's talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. He talks about he's in marketing. Let's get down to it. Everybody knows that when you start developing and building any type of product, you're building multiple avatars. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. We're not building. We're not bodybuilding one person. And we can have all people in a category. We can make one category that says high value man and have. 5,000 avatars for them because they all react differently in, in different instances. Correct. So if that is the case, then what he is not going to tell me is that women who, who when he's when he's talking about what high value men want, all high value men don't fit into that category that he's trying to explain that want cooperation and total control. But he's right? saying the men, the 
he the one he him. speak to. He's he's saying him. him. Okay. Right? And, yeah. and, it's, him, and, it's also and the, the men that he coach and the men that he coaches, yeah. he has a responsibility. So even before I had this conversation, my brother told me I have a responsibility for women who follow me and listen to me and and, and agree with my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because we are not preaching do not get married and do not be in relationships. Women aren't preaching that. We want to get married and we want to be in relationships. Mm -hmm. But I also believe that cooperation in my house is going to look like equal partnership. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything, but if I come to the table and I have an opinion because I did research and I'm asking questions, you're not going to tell me you're making a decision. We're going to have a problem. I've had these problems in the past. I understand what they look like, mm -hmm. right? We're going to say, who knows best? Have you done that? No, because I've done about 10 of those. So let's have a different conversation now. Mm -hmm. But now that appears as though I'm belittling you, but the way in which you approach me with a conversation wasn't as your partner. Mm -hmm. You were basically telling me what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe anybody should tell anybody what they should do. When I come to anybody, I'm always coming with the utmost respect because if I respect you, that's how I would always communicate with you. And what Correct. I dislike about Kevin Samuels' approach and the way that he's been sharing it, because I don't believe that he went to bed every night and was on some control, right? So please don't sell that to men, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm not selling that to women. I absolutely have conceded in a lot of arguments, like, okay, I have to defer to this, right? I'm a woman, I want a man by my side. But what I don't want is a dictatorship. So if we cannot agree to have some type of partnership. And if he is out here and he is now the spokesman and he has taken on this position as a spokesman and men who don't have any other outlet are watching him. I do not agree with the with the responsibility that he's taken to share with them that she needs to cooperate with you. No, she needs to respect you. Mm -hmm. But cooperation can mean a lot of things. It doesn't mean co cooperation doesn't involve negotiation and delegation. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that I know going back to what you said, I, I, I do want to make sure that you understand is like the fact that he's single doesn't matter. I mean, or, or if he's been divorced, Steve Hart has been divorced more than you three know, times, more than three times, you mm -hmm. know, but he's still a woman going to him. You know, but then it's also where you gonna you look at it like, would you rather your mom and dad tell you, hey, don't do crack, don't do drugs, or you listen to the drug who's looking out there like a zombie talking about don't do drugs. You're gonna take that junk a lot seriously. You see that. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. see it. So there's always experience you can take from anybody, good or bad. Correct. You know, because everybody hopefully you want somebody, I think, that's always gonna have some self awareness to them. Right. You know, I think that's the one thing that's missing in a lot of relationships. You know, men and women, it's people being having that self awareness to kind of take a step back and be like, you know what? Correct. Mm -hmm. I'm tripping. Because I, I mean, going through relationships, I've seen it. You know, you get somebody who's very combative, you can be like just talking about, like, hey, I think, like, say if you got kids, I think the kids should, you know, you know, always get up at a certain time and have breakfast at a certain time. Why? I mean, we tired. And like, no, it just needs to be that. Mm -hmm. Like, but if you get somebody who's always just kind of like, Going in there like, oh, you know, just combating, combating. At the end of the day, you like, I'm gonna give it up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do it my damn self. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna have to take marriage in my own hands. And sometimes, both men, women side, it gets to that point where you get fed up. It's just like, if you know somebody's gonna give you resistance in a way, you rather not just deal with it. You always gonna go for the path of least, least resistance. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, what you gonna do? Would you rather get this steak on a platter, or are you actually gonna go out there and kill the cow? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. It's mm -hmm. just it's just human nature. You're gonna go to path of least resistance, and I think for men, we chose to do that to our own detriment because, <clears throat> you know, we get told like we get told very toxic things at an early age. Happy wife, happy life. You know, hey, <laughs> you know, it's cheaper to keep her. You know, all those different <laughs> things. You just learn to kind of deal with it, and after a while, it doesn't feel like what's love. It's just like an obligation. Mm -hmm. It gets to that point, and you, as men, we kind of we kind of accept that in a way, but you could tell it still comes out as microaggression. That's why you, sometimes you may have guys cheating because a lot of guys don't don't live their truth. And a lot of times we're not holding each other accountable either. Like this mm -hmm. one thing, I think the worst thing I've ever gotten told, I think growing up was after how you get heartbroken. All men have experienced this. You can go back and probably ask a guy who was a player, like, so when, when, when did it happen for you? you? Must deal with a heartbreak. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's gets told to women is that, hey, when a woman gets broken, girl, take your time. Do you, cut your hair, do what you got to do, get rid of those bags, go on a trip, you know, let's go. Yep. What guys get told is like, oh, man. Man, fuck it, let's go out, son. I got something yeah. for you. Oh, it's like, hey, man, there's more fish in the sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want more fish in the sea. But nobody ever told us, like, but know when to cast your rod. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. always where you go out there, you deal with chicks. you just having sex, but you never deal with the emotional anguish mm -hmm. or trauma of what of what you put your heart out there yeah. because 
every guy probably when they were little was like, man, this is the girl I really want to like take out, do nice things for. And you find out the one you want ain't want you like that. Oh, that's just devastating. It's devastating. Or that she won what you thought she was. Yeah, yeah, or what you thought she was. And it's devastating. But nobody tells guys how to deal with that. So what we do, we go to the next one. Mm. Same shit. And then you just see it be cyclical, you know? And then it gets to the point like, you don't even see, you don't even see love anymore in that. And for guys, we don't know how to do it. Cause all we know is like, well shit, I just gotta get through this, get through this emotional part, because I ain't never dealt with my own shit. And I think that's where a lot of guys be fucking up, you know? I mean, they they really do. I think men. Us, I think we've been so subjugated to a lot of things. You could talk about maybe the whole hip hop era back, you know, ATL, you know, all those different things. But it's always where, you know, we kind of look at ourselves as not as always being worthy. So we try to go out there and get those things. Instead, somebody telling us, like, no, nah, man, you're good. Just take your time, get over it. Yeah. We don't get that chance. I remember once one uh, joke Dave Chappelle said, you know, there's something I did, you know, that most black men don't have to do when they're, you know, because they're always working was actually think about how I feel. <laughs> you know, yeah. we don't do that. You know, we 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 sometimes do, but then we be like, I just got to go ahead and do what I got to do just to survive. And I think it's even our whole entire culture is black people. It's like we're always in a very survivability. Mm-hmm. You say you bring up a good point because yeah. he went from comedian yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to listener. Yep. To therapist Chris, <laughs> yeah. yep. and 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 you bring up with something that I even struggle with with within my inner circles as well, and that's therapy. Yeah. So as we wrap, we want to kind of just t- tackle this topic of therapy um, amongst black men and your experience with other black men. How how is it well received? Or you know, nowadays it is. Okay. Everybody in my circle now. Um, has either gone through therapy or is, or is going through it. I'd probably say one guy, but he knows that he wants to go through therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, growing up, you know, shout out to Dothan, Alabama, where I'm from. Um, down south, you know, therapy was was the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, pray to Jesus, pray to God about it, you know. And for me, it was always that type of anguish, you know, that was kind of like, all right, I know I'm going to this book. God says, you know, Jesus to turn the other cheek, all different things like that, you know, be slow to anger, time and place for everything. But it just wasn't registering, you know. And you know, most of the times when I was trying to, you know, think about it, because I mean, it's, we always we always have traumatic experiences going back from childhood. Everything kind of leads back to childhood. Yeah. Um, I was a smart guy, um, but I got bullied a lot. Didn't know how to really deal with that. So over time, you know, anger just starts to build up in you. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until 2015, you know, I went to go um, go for anger management because I think it was around the time my my son was being born, and I was like, I don't want to bring that type of anger in. You know, because I okay. see what that can do. You know, I, I know what that can do. So for me, it was, you know, it, it was it was therapeutic. You know, it was some stuff like I was, it would get off my chest. And then I went again uh, around about 20, around about 2017, mm-hmm. and 2017 going 2018, went for therapy again. And, you know, it helps. And I, and I tell anybody out there, don't feel bad about going to therapy. It doesn't mean that you're crazy or they're going to put you in an asylum or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You just got stuff you got to get off your chest and you need to do that in a very, you know, structured professional way. And a lot of times you can always go to your, you know, your your cousin, your brother, anybody, but there's a bias with that. It's best to get unbiased professional help uh, because you'll, you'll be able to not just talk it out, but this person will, the therapist will actually give you plans and certain goals you have to reach. Um, I just recently finished up, you know, um, therapy after almost like three years. And, you know, I met all my goals. You know, mm-hmm. it was just so, where, you know, I had certain things where I had to come, you know, the truth. And I think one of my goals was being able to live in my truth as far as like, hey, setting boundaries, you know, saying what I really want in life. Because that's another thing. Most black people in general, we have hard time with boundary setting, especially mm-hmm. black men. Yeah. Because we've, and black women too. We all got our boundaries always tested. You know, hey, this is my house. What happens? Cops come over, break in your house, you know, do all the things. It's slavery. We just everything's been everything's just been just dismantled as far as who we are. And I tell people this too. I hate that we have to always kind of have to prove ourselves mm-hmm. to white people. It's almost like, you know, it's almost like being a a, a derivative of, of of white consciousness, white mentality. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. you kind of wonder what it'd be like if we didn't say, you know, have to think like that. You know, mm-hmm. you know, we just did our own, but we, everybody's always kind of impeded on us. Yeah. And so I think it even goes from that macro to micro level where, 
you deal with your daily, you know, your daily stuff that, yeah, you need to learn how to set boundaries and do those things. And just because you're in therapy or good out of therapy, but you'll, you know, you'll still have those things that happen in life, but you'll know how to yeah. combat them better. You know, I mean, a lot of people do different um, type of things where they, you know, self-medicate. I know for me, like I remember as an early age, my grandmother, she was an alcoholic. But I knew the reason why she was an alcoholic because she had anger issues. Yeah. You know, she was angry about a lot of things. I think one thing I remember this was really deep was my grandma was a valedictorian in high school, but she was so angry about having to go out there and pick cotton while she see other white kids going to school mm -hmm. on the bus. And I remember she just spazzed out one day. And it was like, man, you know, you just don't know what type of trauma that people have to deal with just for simple things. So, that's, yeah. that's a very important point right yeah. there. There's a lot of trauma going on right now. Mm -hmm. Hence why... Yeah. Shout out to the comedians or what have you. Um, I think my first time doing therapy was, it was January, 2014. I had, you know, you do the the typical um, New Year's resolution thing. And I, you know, I had done it, you know, many years prior to, you know. And then that year, for some reason, coming into that year, I was like, man, I want to try something different, yeah. you know. Because I told myself I wasn't going to say no. Like, I prayed, like, the whole month of December going into the new year. And I was just like, look, anything I tell myself no to mm -hmm. is what I'm going to do. So I just started fasting, right? So the first thing I did is, like, anything I said no to, it was, like, chicken. Like, fuck. Oh, man. Damn, chicken. no chicken. <laughs> chicken. <laughs> I ordered some chicken, but I thought about it. I was like, nah, no chicken. I was like, damn. I said, anything I say no to, I got to do. You know what I'm saying, right? And they're like, maybe you should go to therapy. I was like, no therapy. Oh, now I got to go to therapy. <laughs> so that's how it was. So my jam, that January was the roughest. Like, I, I could barely eat anything because I said no to just about everything. <laughs> TV It was just the worst It was a hard Hard 30, Yo 31 days Never felt that long In my life But that 31 day Yo killed me It brought me down Two sides Like for real Did but it improve it, Your discipline though It improved my discipline It made me realize Why the hell do I Why am I so dependent Upon so many different things Like yeah. why would I say No to this Why would I say No to that Right And it actually became this, I guess The spark for a lot Of different changes That's Nevertheless Therapy was dope. And I think when I, when I learned that, the first one I did, I was like, look, whoever's my therapist has to have a spiritual background, right? Mm -hmm. I can't deal with nobody who don't have no sense of God in their life, right? Yeah. I don't need them to be religious or what have you. I just need somebody who's spiritual, who understand, can understand that dynamic that yeah. someone like me may deal with. Yeah. Found a woman, black woman, Howard grad, the whole nine. I was real specific. I was like, yeah. I gotta go to a, like, they gotta go to a black school. <laughs> and what I realized is... I was I found how difficult it is to find that. It is. Find the black therapist that went to a black school that had, you know what I'm saying? That, that was hard. It is, it is. Found it easier to find a woman. Then when I started looking for a man, even harder. Yep. That started messing me up. Yep. Mm. Not gonna go there. That's a whole nother soapbox. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but um But but, but I, I ask you a question. How many, how how many how many therapists did you have to go through to find the one? Because that's also important too. I, I'm still looking. Okay. I'm still okay. looking. Like I, I will give anybody a chance until you shoot yourself in the foot. When I feel like I'm not, this isn't serving me. Thank you. Yeah. I'm moving on. Yeah. One guy moved on. We right at the consultation, like the first meeting, because yeah. he spent half the time telling me how good he was. I was like, okay. Yeah. So you got to break up with your therapist. Man, listen. Yeah. You hear me? Like he's like, we ain't scheduled our next appointment. I'm like, um, I'm not coming back. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you why, but yeah, I don't. That's I don't. Topic, right yeah, like the he ghosted it. Yeah, because you posted like yeah. the whole point of it. You get what you put into it, and I think that's yeah. one of the biggest things. And that's why a lot of all right. So in my male circle, a lot of the dudes that I know got the mentality of I don't need nobody telling me about me. I know about me. Yeah. Right. But really what I've learned is a lot of people don't feel comfortable being that vulnerable with somebody they don't know and don't trust. Exactly. Right? Yep. And I found that that is the antidote. Yep. How, how like, how willing are you willing to improve, right? Yep. So I, I use this analogy all the time. I tell this to my son, right? Because I told him I'm his, head, I'm his head coach. I'm not his dad, right? <laughs> right? It's a whole nother thing. Don't worry about it. It's not like I'm telling him he ain't mine. It's just... That, that's what they need to talk to. <laughs> just a head coach, right? But I was like, look. It's if I was if, I was, thing. if yeah. I was playing, are you play, You ran track, right? Yeah, yeah. So you ran, what, 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 what race did you run? 800. 800. All right. So look, you had your head coach, yeah. right? But then you had somebody who was just a conditioning coach. You had somebody who focused on those middle distance runners. You had somebody... You had multiple coaches. You probably had three, 
or four. The truth of the matter is all four of them were just sharpening you. Yeah. And that's how I look at therapy. Like in life, we got to figure out who will be a part of our, our sharpening team. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. So who are you going to get in your life? So sometimes people go get a mentor. I bet. They help me see the vision, all right? But then there's things that I need to do. So if I go get a therapist, right, my ther- my best friend is a part of that, that team too, right? Yeah. But my therapist is there to help me work out things that I should be able to recognize in myself to build the strategies mm-hmm. so that I don't always need to go tap a shoulder for somebody who's probably seeing something the same way I am. Exactly. They're supposed to be the eagle looking at it from the perch like, all right, I see everything you got going on. I'm going to tell you what I see on your board. Or what have you. And then when you start seeing what they see, you like, word. Then it helps you now sit on your perch and be like, damn, I shouldn't be talking to that person. I shouldn't have went there. I shouldn't have been doing this. Yep. Blah, blah. And then if you really, really focus on it, all you really realize is, yo, I'm getting sharper. Yep. Which means I'm less prone to making some of the same mistakes. Or I'm able to now better to see my mistakes and know when to pivot and not have to literally be face flat on the ground before I'm like, all right, let me make this change. That's how I see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's a good thing I would say is like, just going through that vetting process. I'll tell anybody out there, just because one therapist doesn't work out, doesn't mean you stop. Keep going. You keep going. You keep going because this is, even if it's a lifelong thing, we got people with therapy been in there for years and it's it's just good to have, you know, you, like you said, you just want to always have somebody over top, Mm -hmm. you know, looking because you don't have a person who's checking you. You don't have anybody who's going to be able to help you understand whatever inhibitions you have or certain vices, you know, because we all struggle with those things. But for somebody to say like, hey, I understand you got those things, but this is how you probably need the best to approach it, you know, healthy wise, because a lot of us do a lot of unhealthy things when we're, you know, in life and making decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's Really good that you're, you know, you're doing that, man. I, you know, I definitely, uh, you know, proud of you, brother. I will definitely say that. Oh, no. And, thank and, you. and, and it becomes a big picture. Oh, no, I mean, I mean seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all love, no, man. You know what's it's, funny? It's Real quick, I apologize. I just thought about two things, right? Yeah. So what Kevin Samuels is doing is offering some form of therapy to some group of people. Yes. Right? And I don't want to discount that. We can object. We can, we can, um. We can object to what he says, his approach. We can feel that kind of way. But somebody needed to hear certain things is going to call that to their attention. It's creating a discussion, yeah. right? Yes. I think it's a creating a discussion for men to start thinking about their self-worth. What do they bring to the table in the first yes. place, yep. right? Because it's not saying that all men are high-value men. It's just saying these are high-value men. So if you check your own checklist and you say, do I qualify? First of all, forget the woman. Do I even qualify as a high-value yes. man? All right. What does it mean? Right. And then you step, step, you step it up. Now, I think to actually do some of that control stuff you talking about, that's a different sense of mentality. Yeah, like that, that got to be the way you operate in general when yeah. you got to control everyone or everything. That's yeah. a whole nother ball game. Exactly. But the second thing is I learned something from our pen tapping live joint that we did. Now we flipped the topic. I wasn't really tripping about it or whatever. I was like, I wanted to be neutral. I was like, we should be neutral. Asia came up with the comp, the, 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 she framed the, the question and I was like, bet, boom, I like this. I went down this rabbit hole like I always do, being a nerd that I can be. <laughs> but what I learned is that important thing, attachment styles. Anybody and everybody who hears this, go get into your attachment styles, right? Because before we get into who we want, what we want, how we want it, when you start really redoing the research and learning about attachment styles, but not just the adult attachment styles, mm-hmm. you go back to see what they did for the infants, the yeah. tests they ran for the infants, and so forth and so forth. And you start to realize how you attach to other people mm-hmm. and what you're prone to actually go to, yep. you start to look at where you need healing in your life. Exactly. Now, I joked on this on the joint when I was like, yeah, the girl who, <laughs> you know, broke up with me at, at, while I was at the pool you know, at eight years old, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She didn't give me the paper I gave her. Like, yeah, I wrote her paper saying, will you be my girlfriend? Yes, no, or maybe. She never gave it back to me Woo. to say, <sighs> scratched out the maybe and said no. You know what I'm saying? Like, Joke, but nevertheless, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's think about think about how many people have created defense mechanisms over the way in which they've been handled in relationships yeah. over time. Yes. The woman who's been cheated on multiple times in previous relationships and now is trying to move on and find new love and she hasn't fully healed. She just got to the point of being comfortable being not with that person. Yeah. Right? So like all of us now, and then it could change. What if your attachment style changes now? Yeah. So just getting into that, I'm like, yo, we all can use some therapy. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good. We can all use some therapy. 
Get some shit off your chest. Oh, that Ooh, pretty yeah. tight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we thought we was going to laugh more. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to laugh next time. Yes. Or what have you. But um, Chris, appreciate you, brother, yeah, for coming you through. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. No. You sided, you sided with See Sanders. what Kevin Samuel does? <laughs> but I, but I, <laughs> I on the show and don't even shake her hand. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because I wasn't <laughs> mad at his message. I was just she was I mad at you. More <laughs> for not being mad at his message. For his messaging. I want him to take more responsibility oh. for well, how he's communicating these things to men who don't have another outlet, who are following him. And I think that Kevin Samuels in his life has definitely made adjustments. He said it. It's my favorite word. Absolutely. And so yeah. I know that. But when he is in his normal content, he is not sharing those adjustments. What he's sharing is this very arrogant male perspective of, you know, I shouldn't be questioned, right? Mm. He wants to be esteemed as a gentleman. He wants to, he wants his integrity and his word to be enough for people. And I think mm. that that's hard because, you know, for me as somebody, I'm a natural questioner. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's going to be problematic. So, I mean, just for me, I just think that he just needs to take a little bit more responsibility in, in his messaging. <sighs> Kevin? That's it. Kevin? I don't have a problem with it. Okay. I think that he's definitely, I mean, because he's attacking me, right? And he's definitely showing me. And so even in having this conversation with people, they were like, yeah, Asia, like you can, you know, you're not as cooperative as you would like to be. But that's not true. <laughs> it's just because but, on the topics that I'm passionate about, I've done a lot. I've done my own research. And so now I yeah. feel like when I come to the table, if I don't know something, I shut up. So I'm not somebody who's going to talk where I have ignorance. Yeah. But that's I think, all but I'm saying. I, I think at the end of the day, though, I think what he's saying, you know, just because you're a woman doesn't mean that it absolves you of your humanity of knowing that you still have things you need to work on. You still have yes. your your, ne your negative. And I think with mm -hmm. women, it's where he's saying, look, you guys got shit too. And I think it's yes. where it's not, it's not said enough. That's why I think a lot of women are having a problem with it. You know, yeah, let's talk about the stuff because you, you, you see it because it's like, hey, you did this. Well, it's because I felt that way. So I'm justified. No, you're not. You're, right. you're not. Yeah, feelings no, don't make you, it true. It don't, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's not the case. And I think that's the thing that men have such a such a huge issue with. I think why Kevin Samuel works for a lot of men and then also women because he's calling people out. And then sometimes I feel like it's a defensive mechanism because I've been through this in the past when women do like, well, it's your tone. But yeah, but you get the message. Like, because cause of career, we're upset, but then you want to go to tone and mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. To me, for me, that's that's just a BS. That's just a BS cop out because you're not really listening to what I'm saying. You're just going to say, well, tone, it just shuts everything down. No, you need to really hear. Of course, I'm passionate about it. Of course, I'm going to be emotional about it. I'm human too. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a man. And another thing is too, ladies, like, with all due respect, you got to stop telling a man about what he is and ain't. Guess what? As he grows up, he's going to be a man. He may be an ain't shit man, <laughs> but he's still a man. We don't go around to my, you ain't woman enough. You ain't woman enough for me. Nobody, no man ever does that. <laughs> no man ever does that. Is that is a good point. You don't, you don't hear that. I mean, it's like, how's a woman going to tell me how to be a man when they don't know what exactly that feels like biologically? We don't go through the same type of patterns or anything. Like, it's just like if a draft came up to a dag on zebra, like, you know, you got, you, you got stripes, right? You should, you should have spots. Don't make no damn sense. Yeah. It, it just, it just doesn't. And I mean, and it goes with all aspects of, of, of people you you are who you are and whether it be for better or for worse you you people have to understand that and respect that and I think that's just that's what the level of disrespect that a lot of men are almost afraid to say because they get vilified this goes down to even a young age you know like understand like yeah call him out when he's wrong be accountable but don't tell him that he's not man enough trust me the world's already gonna make us a man before we even know it Chris I gotta ask you this question now Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Is that in your comedy? Do you put that into your comedy? These you relationship dynamics? I, I will. I, I, you know what? I have. Well, I did talk to talk about one thing about age. One thing about age. Age is a big thing where I feel like women, they, they gauge uh, men differently. Because you know how it is. Like, Let me ask you this question. As a, as a woman, what's like the sweet spot age for y'all? Like, where you'd be like, oh yeah, I'm like the sexiest I am. I'm at the top of that my That is game. so hard because I used to think every year, like it changes. Yeah. 
Because I think it's also too like how a woman looks and carries herself, like how she feels about her appearance. Mm-hmm. That's what I, I think. That's my answer. Okay, but if you had to put a number to it, though, if you had to I put can't a put a number to okay. it. Okay, let me ask the fellas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. I knew I was just gonna say something. No, playing. But uh, but the sweet spot for a man. Like what's the what's the sweet spot age for a man where they'd be like, you know what? I'm at a good place. Like I can't pull some this way. You know, pull some that way. Like what's the good age? Shit, right now, my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm three eight. Three eight. Okay. Yeah, three eight. So yeah, nigga, feel I, I sexy today. That sweet spot for all men would probably be around twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. Like when you you know you you're done with school, you got a little bit of dating under your belt. Probably got some some money in your pocket. Starting to plan for the future, mm-hmm. and yeah. you, you got your your man confidence. So yeah, twenty five. Yeah. So 25? I I would say thirty. I was gonna say, I, yeah. I when he said 30. what he said, I was like maybe more like thirty. Because I told a joke about this, and it's crazy. Because like men, I'm sorry. So for men, like you know, like when you like twenty nine, you may meet a girl who's like maybe like 32, 33. She bad. You having a good conversation, y'all good vibing. She was just like, so like, man, what's your sign? You know, you go okay. When, when's your, when, how old are you? When's your birthday? Oh, you twenty nine. Uh uh-uh. uh, you hear that? Uh uh-uh. uh, uh-huh. you know. That's yeah. it. You're like, damn. But then you turn thirty, they'd be like, okay, you know, because thirty is that age where it's like I'm still cool enough to still talk to younger girls, but then older women see me as like, okay, possible, settle. yeah, possible. He's in a possible settle. range. Hey, it's possible range. And she it's, wanna, it's she so rock the weird. It's bit. like that. I mean, I, I told a joke. You could be twenty nine years and three hundred fifty five days, and they're like, uh uh-uh. uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It, it's just. It's just something yeah. about it. And I think for women. You know, um, and you know what? Yeah. I just want to say yeah. that that is true yeah. only because, like, our parents have told us that, like, younger men, they just, they're not there yet. The maturity isn't yeah. there yet, right? That's why I said So for women who fast. are, like, yeah, yeah. thinking about. And that car insurance <laughs> goes down. <laughs> you're not married, though, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you're 31, 32, and you meet a guy like 29, 27, you know, you know that the possibilities that he's looking for marriage are slim. So you don't yeah. even want to waste your time. That's what uh-uh is about. Oh, really? So it's that, like, 30-plus age men start to think about they want a family, too. And that's about the time. Because I feel like for men, and I don't know whether this is true or not, you guys yeah, will yeah. tell me, but it's not until they want a family that they start to really dig into the value of a woman, right? And so no. that's, for me, been problematic because you'll hear a lot of men talking about, oh, what's her value? What is her value is between her legs and all of this, right? But it's not until they want a child and they realize that you need that woman to have a child. And yeah. now she becomes value. Now you want to know about what she thinks and what she cares about and what she's passionate about and what she does all day and what her interests are, well, right? Yeah, well, I'll say this too. It's like, no matter if a man is a good guy or a bad guy, we all want sex. Of course. We all want sex at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. I think where it's like, man, is this person cool enough to vibe with? Like, I, I commend my sister and her husband, right? Like, my sister's probably like, probably one of the dopest wives I've ever, ever seen. You know why? Because she plays video games. Like, wow. like, like you see, like, <laughs> I mean, she cold. It. You get her on some, like, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto. She into it. She into it, man. Like, it's just like, and I think most most women don't understand. I think Patrice O'Neill had this one joke. He yeah. said, he said, ladies, <clears throat> let's just say if some bad accident happened and your pussy broke. You couldn't use it no more. You <laughs> I remember that joke. <laughs> your pussy broke. And he said, what would you do? How would you please your man? And ladies were like, anal, oral. You know, I don't know if I can say that. You know, all this stuff like that. And he said, ladies, y'all talk about me objectifying y'all, but y'all just relegated yourself to a series of holes. holes. Yeah. And he's like, y'all ain't about, you know, play video games, get better at sports, or, you know, bring, up, bring, up, bring another yeah. chick in, nothing. You know, nothing. so how are you going to be mad at me? But it's just some of those things I think, as it goes, go back, women don't really understand they don't really try to look at that man like, oh, this is so annoying. Why does he do, do, he do anything he want me uh, that want, that I want to do? It's like I want to watch reality shows. Come down, babe. Come sit down and watch reality shows. I really want to watch that. Why do you want to play video games all the time? Maybe you should get on these sticks and find out. We can make this a fun game, you know. Back up. And I guarantee you, if you did that with a man, he'd be like, man, dog, she my best friend, dog. Because what you what's a man said, man, she my best friend. It's done. Till she good. start kicking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> but you but you like it though. You like it though. You be like. <laughs> I bet you can't do that shit while you, you on top of me, though, right? You know, you just make it fun. You just, I mean, that I, that's what I'm saying. That reminds me of something. You just make real it quick. fun. When the Nintendo <laughs> yeah, Wii came quick. out, no, no, real quick, my bad. When the Nintendo Wii came out, Everybody yo, that, yo, I lost so many games to women. <laughs> yes. To the point I was like, yo, fuck what I came here for. I am winning before I leave. Nintendo yo. was definitely on some bullshit. <laughs> the way they even be doing the joints. It's like, yo, that's not how you do it. You should not be fucking me. <laughs> <laughs> but 
On that note, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank y'all for listening to episode 163 of the Putting Air Podcast. We are just so dope. I, I don't even know how to even put it into words. I appreciate you coming. You dropped a lot of jewels today. You made me think about some real things, and I think it's going to make our listener think about some real things, so we definitely want that feedback. Yeah. But shout out, Chris. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for having me now. Where can they follow you online? Hey, you can find me at the Chris Austin. Um, starting to get a website. Be ready. Uh, ChrisAustinComedy.com. So be on the lookout. Okay, okay. Yeah. Any new perform- any performances anytime soon? Anything you got going on? Well, yeah, I'm going to start trying to do some sketches. Okay. So I'll be looking for that, you know, later on this year. So it's just trying to get, you know, the right team content, take care of the kids and all that good stuff. You know, that's life. COVID, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, all that coronavirus, you know. But, hey, you know, if people out here still doing things, I definitely appreciate everybody for their grind, mm-hmm. you know, and just... You know, everybody keep working hard and, uh, you know, y'all see me out there. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you once again, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, follow Tone Sets online at BTB underscore SES. Asia, Asia at AField 1823. And me at It's George D. We ask that you go follow the podcast right now at Pintap underscore podcast. That's P I N T A P underscore podcast. Click the link there. Got the website. Subscribe to every audio platform of your choice. Um, listen to all the um, audio and watch the videos on the website as well. We want to thank you guys for listening. Tune in soon for Thursday on Thursday at eight for the tap in. We're gonna have a nice little conversation. Might be back black male therapy. We'll see. That's it. We out. Peace.